All right, everybody, welcome to day one of Embracing Diversity Week. We are here at the afternoon session titled Cannabis and Social Equity. Um, we have a really wonderful panel uh, prepared for you all tonight. We uh, This event is hosted with, obviously, a lot of support from the EDI office at UCLA Anderson, as well as by the Cannabis Business Association, the Black Business Student Association, and the Entrepreneurs Association. I'm gonna start by introducing our moderator, who will then introduce all of our speakers who are here in person. So our moderator is Brad Rowe. He is a cannabis policy equity and public health and safety researcher and educator who has committed the last decade, decade to understanding and sharing all he has learned on cannabis policy, consumption, production, and regulation. He is the first person to teach cannabis policy at the university level and is authoring the first college curriculum on the topic. Brad is a newly appointed associated, associate editor for cannabis policy at the Cannabis and Cannabinoid Research Journal. Brad has designed, implemented, and delivered a dozen public policy research projects over the last decade through a myriad of roles. He is a lecturer of public policy at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs, and he started teaching cannabis policy in society in 2020, the first of its kind in the country. Course topics include regulation and taxation, mass incarceration, social equity licensing, and job creation. He serves as faculty master, faculty member to the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative, coordinating the criminal and juvenile justice research team and the California Cannabis Data Collection Process Project. So let's welcome Brad, and then he will introduce the rest of our guests. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, well, welcome. I guess this is the first uh, event for uh, for the week, and I know you guys have got a lot of great stuff coming up. Uh, when I got the call, the opportunity to uh, to join you guys and to be a part of this panel, my hope was to actually be there with you guys in Los Angeles. I had to travel, so I'm on the road and joining you this way. Um, but I really wanted to make it work because I love this group of people that's in front of you today. And we're going to have a great conversation. We've gone through some topics that are really, really interesting and going to help you uh, as students, as faculty, as uh, members of the community at UCLA to really get a sense of what does social equity mean? Why are we doing it? Why is it important? And most, most importantly, what is the lived experience of, of these uh, three people who are with you today uh, as far as their uh, beginnings and how they've started their businesses? And uh, we're going to hear a lot about that. So the first one that I'll have the uh, pleasure of introducing is Kika Keith. She is a nationally recognized entrepreneur and activist with 25 years of experience building high growth businesses and community organizations that operate at the intersection of social justice and cannabis. Kika currently serves as co-founder and president of the Social Equity Owners and Workers Association and is the founder and CEO of the Life Development Group, a constellation of cannabis brands, retail spaces, and community organizations that leverage the power of cannabis to transform lives, shape culture, and empower underserved communities. Kika's celebrated career at the intersection of entrepreneurship and activism has made her uniquely positioned to capitalize on the modern consumer's desire for companies that prioritize both products, quality, and social impact. In August of 2021, Kika launched a highly anticipated Gorilla RX wellness company. I remember this, the first black woman owned social equity dispensary in Los Angeles. Kika's advocacy has proven instrumental to securing groundbreaking, widely celebrated cannabis policies and programs. Most notably, a settlement with the city of Los Angeles for an additional 100 of the city's cannabis licenses designated for entrepreneurs from communities disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Her leadership has been nationally recognized in a variety of local, national, and international news media, including Forbes, Esquire, the LA Times, New York Times, CNN, BBC, MTV, HBO, People Magazine, and The Guardian, and Politico. Uh, I give you Kika Keith. Let's give her a round of applause. And next we have Jesse Horton. Jesse is chief executive officer at Loud, an award-winning cannabis company that embodies the art of uh, urban craft cultivation. He's headquartered in Portland, Oregon. Loud exists effortlessly at the intersection of urban culture and epic nature, unique to the city 
and the Pacific Northwest. Jesse co-founded the Minority Cannabis Business Association, the first and largest nonprofit organization developed to create equal access and economic empowerment for cannabis businesses, their patients, and the communities most affected by the war on drugs. Jesse's on the board of directors for the Oregon Cannabis uh, uh, Oregon uh, Cannabis Association and served a two-year advisory board term at Marijuana Business Daily. Jesse's a board advisor at Ben's Best, the new venture by Ben Cohen of Ben & Jerry's fame, aimed at funding Black-owned cannabis companies and further supporting the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition and the Last Prisoner Project. Jesse also served on numerous federal, state, and local cannabis regulatory advisory committees to help shape the legal cannabis markets in both Oregon and California, and co-founded the nonprofit organization New Project, a historic initiative financially seeded in part by the city of Portland since 2019. Currently, Jesse's developing um, curriculum and instructing the first college in New York to have a cannabis major. Uh, LIM College, as well as doing similar work at HBCU Medgar Evers College, which I believe is in New York, as well as part of the CUNY program. Uh, Whitney Beatty is a dynamic former reality television development executive. She's turned uh, cannabis entrepreneur after 15, after a 15 year career that saw her raise from an assistant at the iconic William Morris Agency to a senior vice president of development at Warner Brothers Telepictures. She transitioned to use her knowledge of brand and niche markets in the cannabis space. Inspired by a lack of stylish, safe cannabis storage systems and a disdain for storing medicine in a shoe box, Whitney's first company, Apothecary Brands Incorporated, was selected for the first cohort of Canopy, Can uh, Canopy San Diego Cannabis Business Accelerators. Whitney subsequently pitched and won the Arcview Group's 2017 Los Angeles Pitch Prize and was selected at the fall 2017 Pipeline LA Portfolio Company. Whitney's newest endeavor in the cannabis space is Josephine and Billy's, the first dispensary focused on the recreational and medicinal needs of women of color. It's named for Josephine Baker and Billy Holiday, two black women who are demonized for cannabis use. And the store itself is a tea pad, the black version of a speakeasy where black people would consume cannabis and socialize in the twenties and thirties, complete with a false wall entrance. Their true focus is on consumer education and everything about the concept from store organization with a focus on ailments and attributes to signage to their extensive community engagement is geared to their customers in store experience. It is in direct response to the lack of participation, education and medical cannabis usage in the community in communities of color, which can be tied to the destruction of communities witnessed during the war on drugs. So with that, I give you our three guests, Kiki Keith. Jesse Horton and Whitney Beatty. And I'm going to pass it back over to our room here uh, just so I can get a sense of uh, how we're going to get started. Or if you guys would like, we can get started with the questions. You need it. You need a drink of water after all those bios. Man. <laughs> that was a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was, all, it was all worth saying. It's all it's all great stuff. And actually, one thing uh, that I love about Jesse's company loud is that um, it stands for what is what does loud stand for? It's got it's got a, love it's a our great, weed daily. Love our weed daily. That's right. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's fantastic. Um, OK, well, it sounds like we can just get started if that's OK. Um, I can't see anything here. So uh, if there's uh, if you guys want to give me a nod or uh, someone can say yes, we should just get started with the with the questions. We can do that. Yeah, let's get started. OK, awesome. Um, OK, this first one goes to uh, to 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 Jesse um, and to Whitney. Uh, what is the goal of social equity licensing and support programs? Either one of you guys can take this one. I mean, the, 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 so in social equity within the cannabis space, and I think that's important that we, we note that um, uh, that is a concept that communities of color have been disproportionately disenfranchised by the war on drugs and therefore deserve prioritization and uh, and licensing uh, during legalization. Um, and I think that there is generally sometimes confusion there because social equity in this case only really applies for people who are going out 
after licenses within the space. Um, that's what these city programs are, are doing. Um, social equity looks different depending on where you are. The very first social equity program in the country was um, in Oakland. Uh, subsequently, we've seen that spread throughout the country, San Francisco, down to LA. Um, and now there's a multitude of social equity programs, not nearly enough, but, the, but there's a lot. And each one has different requirements. Um, or hoops to jump through, if you will, in order to participate uh, in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, the requirements here um, have a uh, three-tier sort of thing. It is location, have you lived in a disproportionately affected area, i.e. a place that has been over-policed um, for uh, a number of years. It is a financial, um, have you made under this amount of money? Um, and now um, it is also, you're required to have a cannabis conviction. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And I think, you know, I think getting down to the, to the foundation of it, to me, um, when we first got started in the industry and, you know, there were still a lot of people involved when I got started about 10 years ago, but you would go to conferences like this and a reoccurring theme that you would hear is, you know, we don't even have an industry yet. We don't have an industry. We don't have an industry. And, you know, as things started moving along, it started to become apparent that we had an industry, um, the flow of goods, right, economic activity, all these things. But we started thinking on a bigger level of, you know, why, why not, you know, not just another industry, but what about a better industry? And the idea of, you know, having the opportunity to create a better industry was really apparent for us in cannabis because, you know, people like myself, my father was arrested and spent four years in prison for cannabis uh, distribution before he was supposed to go to college. And, you know, instead of spending his next four years in college, he spent his next four years in prison, um, you know, for what we consider a small amount of cannabis right now. So you think about that and you think about the disproportionate arrest rate um, throughout the country, four to one, some cities as much as you no know, 19 or 20 to one of black people being arrested, um, you know, for crimes of possession, uh, cannabis related nonviolent crimes. But, you know, not only just the high arrest rates, but also the sentencing rates and all of those things that happen, the discrimination afterwards. You know, my dad could only get a job as a janitor when he got out, even after he got his degree. Uh, you know, getting out of college. So we started thinking, you know, this cannabis product, right, when, you know, everyone consumes it, every different demographic, every different age, you know, no matter Republican, Democrat, independent, it doesn't matter. The idea that everyone doesn't have the ability to benefit from this industry um, because of these past injustices was just something that, you know, was just unbelievable and something that I think many people can't stand for. So I think, you know, at the crux of it, you know, social equity to me is about making sure that everyone has a place in this industry to help grow it in an innovative way, but also to uplift communities and especially communities that have been set back as it relates to cannabis prohibition enforcement. I, I Justin, love yeah, go ahead, um, Justin. Is, is this is this Kika? Yes. <laughs> Kika, I, just, I wanted to move, I wanted to move over to you. All right, uh, all right, good. No, go go ahead. I got I got I wanted to I wanted to follow up on this topic with you. I had a special question for you. Go ahead. All right. Um, you know, it's really important to understand the history. Um, because the word equity seems to mean different things in different places, although when cannabis is recreationalized, it's always about writing the war on drugs, and that's what's fed to the voters. And I would love to read a quote from Nixon's aide back in 1964 so that we understand where this all begins. And it says, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or against the war or blacks. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. So when we speak about equity, it's to those who were disproportionately arrested, not just those who were affected by the raids 
um, for weed or got arrested for weed, but it was those who were disproportionately arrested. And we know at the heart of that were black folks and, and digging e even deeper into the arrest rates, we know it's black and Latinos. And that's very important when you look at places like New York that is using women, which is important, and is using veterans, which is important, but that is not equity and those are not those who are disproportionately affected by the war on drugs. And to students who end up being the voices, this is coming up in, in different laws across the country, it's important that we echo the history of what this is about so that we get the definition right and that those who are really wronged are able to benefit in this industry and not only in the industry, but those tax dollars should go to those communities that were disproportionately affected by the war on drugs and there should be employment opportunities for those who were disproportionately affected by the war on drugs. And that is true diversity in this industry. And if we don't understand that, we won't be able to effectuate the laws. Thanks, Kika. Uh, so you, you're bringing up some things that are really important, uh, especially uh, bringing economic uh, stimulus, uh, employment opportunities uh, and, and opportunities for entrepreneurs and, and communities that were disproportionately impacted in the war on drugs. What was it that drove you as an advocate to fight the city of Los Angeles to try and get those uh, 100 additional licenses um, brought out for that purpose? That history that I speak of, um, I was raised by revolutionaries and have a profound love for black people. I understood that we've been left out of every single industry deliberately from cotton to tobacco to alcohol, you name it, we're always at the last. And so I saw this as a first time, although there's been a lot of uh, civil laws being done, right, to affect race and systemic racism, there's never been laws in place that actually affect our economic abilities. And so now that there were laws in place that those who were affected have the ability to then go for licenses and have enough revenue generated to not only feed your families, which was of interest to me. I'm a single mother, three girls. It was a way for me, a pathway to self-sufficiency, but I also knew that there was enough revenue that could be generated, enough jobs that could be created in my community if, in fact, we were able to hold um, these politicians to the letter of the law, and I did not think it would be so difficult. You know, um, I went inactive on the shelves of Whole Foods. I had a first to market product in Whole Foods since 2008, a chlorophyll water named Gorilla Life. And I learned how to work within a compliant and regulated industry and transferred, thought I was going to just transfer that over, went inactive on 2017 on the shelves of Whole Foods, thinking I had nine months, went to Oak Oaksterdam, immersed myself in all things cannabis. And then I slowly realized that the program was designed to fail. There was no education. There was no access to capital. And they kept moving the start line back as we had to hold on to properties. My property was $12,000 a month. And so I realized that this was something worth fighting for, that it was important than just myself get across the finish line and that we weren't going to allow this Trojan horse, not again in my lifetime, to um, come into our steps and open up this market and not see true representation from black and brown people. And that has been my driving force to organize and educate community members uh, to make sure that we end up winning in this industry. Industry. Yeah. So real estate requirements, big deal, cost a lot of money, uh, burn through a lot of capital while you're waiting to get everything cleared up and open your doors for business. Uh, you brought up New York. And so I'm just going to go over there for a second. Uh, they're working on a program where they want to provide real estate and try to help out with that. We'll see how that goes. Uh, there's a lot of language and a lot of things that are sort of getting pulled together on that front. But um, are any of you, and, and I think Jesse might have some thoughts on, are you aware of social equity licensing uh, differences uh, between states, maybe Illinois, New York, uh, different cities in, in California? Yeah, there's there's a lot of differences. And I, I don't think I could, you know, I have enough time to go through, you know, kind of the nuances of the differences um, because, you know, all the way from um, reduced fees, priority licensing, um, technical assistance. So these are some of the things that are common things. But, you know, I think what New York is doing is different than what any other state has done in that they have focused on licensing uh, people who qualify for social equity before anyone else in the market. So they had a program where they licensed um, social equity uh, cultivators first, and now they're working on the retailers, I think actually were just announced. I think there's, you know, a lot of issues, and I think um, both uh, ladies have kind of alluded to of who qualifies for social equity. And um, those are things that are really difficult to get past, I think, through the law 
in many states, um, any race based language, things of that mm -hmm. nature um, have really hurt the cause in many ways. But, you know, I think what what New York is doing is very different. I think it's very brave. And, I, I you know, I hope that they have success with really licensing the people who really deserve it. Yeah, Jesse, that's a really good point. And I'd actually like to get back to that because it is a challenge and it's a concern and it'll sort of segue into our next topic on federal legalization. But um, and there might be some lawyers in the room, but I believe it's the dormant clause and it uh, you can't really do anything to impede interstate commerce, including having location requirements. So a lot of social equity programs that are out there, including some in California, have location requirements, including you've got to be from this zip code or this place that was disproportionately impacted. And New York, I believe, has tried to work around a little bit saying, well, if we arrested you, then you qualify. Can you talk a little bit about what maybe we should be pushing back on what is the reality for some of these standards? If we can't use race and we can't use location, how do we qualify social equity applicants for specialized uh, positioning for licenses or supports? How do, how, do we, how do we navigate that to all three of you? Well, <laughs> um, I think there's a couple of things. There's always a quick push for federal legalization and they wrestle on banking um, we've heard these same pushes with the state of California, and then they go ahead and pass through it. But the real thing that needs to be done is a, a federal definition of social equity. Um, because when we're talking about what we're battling with in the state of California, where you can't use race, but if you look at every single analysis, it speaks of black and browns being those that were disproportionately affected. But yet we can't put that as a qualifier. And as you see in New York, you can't put that as a qualifier. They just had a lawsuit on November 10th, um, where federal district uh, court just uh, stalled the New York licensing process for retail because of this residency requirement. But then if you can't serve the people that were damaged in your community by the arrest, um, then how are you servicing social equity, which to me is that Trojan horse? You best believe those lobbyists of these white corporations knew all of these things exist. I hear it in every time when I go to a senator or an assembly member in the state and we're pushing for um, a statewide social equity definition, they always speak of the equal protection clause. They say there's no way around it. They don't even want to push it, even though they think it's important because they're afraid of a lawsuit. And so then we're in this quandary where now, Social equity is stalled, but all of these other businesses are able to be first to market. They're establishing themselves. They're establishing their brands. They're establishing their dispensaries in these locations while our program is stalled. And so I do believe that that's where it needs to start federally, that there needs to be some sort of amendment or exclusion specifically for this because we've seen it, whether it be for the Native Americans. There are there are laws that exist that are because of the righting the wrong of what has been done by the United States, period. And I believe that that has to start federally, that we're pushing for a definition at the federal level so that the states will not have to worry about these lawsuits that we're currently contending with. Yeah, and I think, you know, what we often believe is that because of the dormant clause or because of some legal clauses that it is not possible to enact policies that are effective. And I think what it comes down to a lot of times when you're in those rooms is students like you, right, or, you know, young people who are willing to push that envelope, young people who are willing to uh, do more research, who are willing to find creative ways, right, to be effective. I believe in Illinois, if I'm not correct, um, they were, uh, Toy Hutchinson, um, who's now with Marijuana Policy Project, a really intelligent sister who's in the cannabis industry and is really pushing policy, um, they were able to get some language carved out around disproportionate arrest rates, and I think, you know, that's a way. Right. So I think lawyers often, especially in the cannabis industry, are kind of trained to risk, stay away from risk. It makes my job more difficult. Um, but it takes, you know, people who really believe in the cause and who have the right level of education and the right background to say, hey, no, this is another intelligent way to do this. And we're willing to take on that fight. So I think a lot of it is around that, not just throwing up your hands and saying, oh, can't do that. Let's do something easy and figuring out ways to intelligently, you know, affect problems and go at it in different ways. So, um, you know, you can't run away from those things. But I, I think another thing that is needed in order to make these programs work better, the thing that hurt me the most or the thing that could have, um, it took me eight years from when I started growing in my basement to actually have a business that actually was something, right? I felt like I was on how to be a millionaire 
or what was that call, right? Where um, they call and you have three questions and you can phone a friend and you can do all these things. Yeah, who wants to be a millionaire, right? But if you, you can get all the way up to question two or you answer question three wrong and you get it wrong and you walk away with nothing, right? And everyone's laughing at you and everything, right? I felt like I was there up until like last year. So the idea that some of these businesses are brought in without the ability to get any capital, but also with these um, time limits on when they need to open their business or when they have to be open by is just really uh, harmful and really hurtful to businesses who just need time to get through the toll gates and build their business and build their proof of concept. So to me, the time limits, I think that many of these businesses are facing in these states are really arbitrary and are hurting the cause in many ways. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna uh, echo what uh, both of these uh, extremely intelligent people have said because it's nothing but the truth. Um, I think that one of the biggest issues that we have is the fact that the people who can afford lobbyists have absolutely no interest in social equity. And the interest that they do have um, is, is Trojan horsing whatever the hell they wanted to do into our world. And because we don't have the money to come together um, and be able to get our own lobbyists, we're stuck trying to unwind what they're telling our, our congressmen, what they're telling our representatives, and it becomes a lot of work. Um, I'm vice president of an organization called Supernova Women. We're a 501c3 that seeks to encourage women of color to become stakeholders in the cannabis space through education, advocacy, and networking. Um, one of the things that we did last year is a social equity impact report. Um, so we looked at all the social equity programs that are out there right now, in order to be able to have a real conversation with cities about if you put this pro program in place, will it help? You know, because at the end of the day, people were speculating, oh, social equity is a failure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those things made my heart stop. So we wanted to really get into the data. And what we were able to find is that if you if a city spends a dollar on social equity, they'll get back at least a dollar fifty and can get up to five dollars back, depending on what they do with that money. Um, and that becomes the critical point here. You know, we've got equity programs that are no more than a five hundred dollar, you know, off coupon on, you know, <laughs> your fees. But if you have an equity you know, a program that offers um, technical assistance, if you have a program that offers legal assistance, if you have a program that offers financial funding assistance, and that is incredibly critical. Uh, don't even get me started. That's a whole nother side conversation. Um, but when you have these things in place, we can see that it pours back into the community. The jobs pour back into the community. The opportunities pour back into the community. And so sitting on this side, you know, that's what we end up advocating for is to make sure that when we see these programs come into place, that they're putting all the tools necessary for people to survive and thrive, not to be just franchisees of MSO, but to be able to have their own business and have that business survive and do well. So let's talk a little bit about uh, MSOs, multi-state operators, um, consolidation, which is already happening. And there's going to be a larger version of it once we have federal legalization. But right now, with the way that it's shaped out with the House uh, of Representatives, um, it's unlikely or it's a little less likely that we're going to deschedule cannabis anytime soon. But what we might be able to accomplish, as a couple of you alluded to, was working on banking. You know, we have the Safe Bank Act that might allow businesses to get access to capital, uh, to be able to use financial instruments, credit cards in your stores, uh, to pay payroll, to do transactions inside of the industry. Is, is that enough? Does that level the playing field out? Or as you mentioned, um, do we need to be doing work with helping people out with real estate and legal and capital uh, access and and some of these other things and and i just want to throw this in there because i know a couple of you are founders and leaders of large social equity associations and organizations what does the community have to do inside of your organizations to swim in unison to work together to have power in numbers to be able to have the have the access and the influence to bulk purchase to have buyers clubs to do things that can sort of mock what a what an MSO is, which is a large organization built up of a, a bunch of constituent parts under a large umbrella that's all super funded. 
how do is is the idea to to get some banking going and then maybe try to imitate the MSOs as a bunch of smaller businesses together? How how do you compete? I'm not, so. I have mixed feelings on safe banking. Everybody wants to tell us that this is going to be the end all be all. But you know what? I've been black my whole life, my whole life. And what I know for sure is that even in other industries, just because we have access does not mean that we're going to get that credit. Doesn't mean that we're going to be able to achieve those loans. Uh, Doesn't you know, we've seen redline. We've seen so many things happen within the banking industry that I refuse to put all of my hope in banking. The joy of banking is, yes, there might be less cash um, around, but, you know, I've got a bank account now. Um, I'm paying a lot of fees for it. I might get an account that has less fees, less, um, you know, regulation over it. Um, But do I think that that changes the game? No, I do not. I don't. I mean, does any do you guys feel differently? You know, uh, no, I don't believe. I think, you know, you're exactly right to be skeptical um, about the banking system um, and the, and its ability to really give everyone in the cannabis industry outside of MSOs uh, the, the type of resources that are going to help people get to another level. Um, without a doubt, you know, I still think that there is a lot of benefit. For example, we own a real estate property. Uh, that is valued right now at $5 million and we only owe $1 million on it, right? So in the ideal world, I would be able to go to the bank and say, okay, you know, I want to refinance or, hey, let me get this equity out, right? I have three or $4 million and I can take my business to a different level. Um, I don't have the ability to do that because there's cannabis operations on my real estate and that limits the ability or my ability to go and get banking. So I think that there are some opportunities where the fair banking and, you know, fair banking with equity provisions that were really pushed by some of our colleagues um, out, out in the East Coast, uh, Shalene Title and um, some, other, some other great people out there who helped to add some equity provisions to safe banking. And hopefully that gets passed. Um, I, I think that, you know, it, it will help. And I think that as it relates to, you know, joining together to mimic MSOs. I think most businesses like mine that are getting started are really just trying to survive, right? Are trying to get to a level of stability and then maybe try to get to a level of building some scale and what they know that they can do themselves, right? For example, you know, a cultivation business investing in LED lights, right? It's something that makes a lot of sense in many ways. But when you look at LED lights costing you know, $2,400 versus HID costing $230, um, you know, it's much more difficult for us to get to that next level. Now, if we do get banking and we do get some of these things, then we'll be able to invest in things to help us to scale so that we then can compete more with MSOs. But honestly, I don't have a problem competing with MSOs. I don't have a problem competing with large cultivation facilities, Craft cultivators, anybody who's a cultivator who understands premium cannabis, it's very difficult to produce, right? And it takes a certain level of understanding, a certain level of knowledge, a certain level of commitment that is very difficult to do, especially the larger you get. So we have no problem. We eat, you know, large cannabis companies lunch all the time when we go and we can get next to them on the shelf. So I think there is a lot of growth there. Um, natural competition that can happen before we necessarily have to um, look at maybe, you know, the scale of an MSO. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I believe before we start talking about federal legalization and when you talk about organizing, um, and Jesse, you're right, you know, it's, it's hard. We're trying to get fully established as businesses before we can truly link up. But I think there's a bigger picture here, and that is government relations. Um, all of us need to be civically engaged and effectuate these policies so that when they're pushing forward with federal legalization, we're talking to enough, enough Congress uh, people and senators and making sure that the policies are in place that we want to see so that our businesses can co-op and work together. Together. And to me, that's been the biggest thing or the challenge with us as social equity applicants is that the greater community does not see the value of fighting for us. And so then we're fighting while we're trying to open our businesses and it is just not humanly possible. Say that. And we don't have the money, nor should we be spending our money on lobbyists either. But we found that with the lawsuit, we organized. Sometimes we would have 20, 30 people. We would get buses that would go down to City Hall. It wasn't just a quick lawsuit. 
You're talking about months after months, years after years that we were organizing and going down and demanding that things be changed. And then it was a lawsuit. But if we didn't have the community members, we were going out to neighborhood councils. We have folks, uh, Maha from UCLA that was coming out and, and giving information on why it was important to have social equity retailers in the community to make sure that we had safe cannabis. It took so much organizing and education. But as social equity applicants who are working to build these businesses, we we just don't have the manpower, oftentimes not the skill set of what it takes to organize the legal battle, organize the communication, utilize the marketing skills to be able to get folks rallied together to call the senators, the whole back in the 60s, that whole civil engagement process, it works. But it does require a greater audience and we are tired of standing by ourselves because this is not just a social equity issue, it's a social justice issue. It's a human rights issue. If we look at how many brethren and sisters that are still locked up, how many children are in foster care because their children were locked up or killed on the streets. This is a right and a wrong that's more than us just having businesses. And so it really, it really needs a greater audience that's getting behind us and on the bullhorns, at your colleges, at the churches and places where cannabis is taboo and talk about this as a human rights and as a civil rights issue. And then when enough of us are standing there and we're in alignment with what we're saying, we can effectuate these policies, but that that's critically important because as they say on the outside, the safe banking will help and decriminalize it for, you know, those that are locked up. We know that on the surface when Biden just said that, I think it was a, a couple thousand people <laughs> that were able to take advantage of that um, as opposed to I'm sure over 80,000 people that should be getting out. And so it will require more manpower and people organizing that are not equity applicants, but community members that are organizing with us to effectuate this change. You bring up a great point. And, uh, you know, it, it's uh, the federal federal changes, federal law changes can can only go so far. The states have got to have got to get in. So but thank you for bringing it back to the, the ground level, to the street level, because I think that's really important. And I, I, I guess we're at Anderson. Right. So there might be some people in the audience who are interested in thinking, you know, maybe they would like to start a business and maybe someone, you know, there tonight might be a social equity uh, applicant or a licensee at some point. Uh, if I could e ask each of you, maybe just to what, what are the investments that are required to start a business? And if you were to start over, what would you change about your approach to establishing your business? I'll, I'll, I'll let all three of you guys you know, pipe in on that. Um, I guess I'll start. Uh, so funding, I mean, funding is critical in a space like this. And we've talked about banking, but we haven't really gotten into why it's so important. I can't go down to Bank of America and get a bank loan for my cannabis business. We're still federally illegal. Um, so I can't get though, you know, a SBA loan. I can't go and get a small business loan. Um, as Jesse says, I also can't refi my house. Um, you know, so we're stuck in a place where we have to be able to raise money from angel investors or, you know, VCs. If you're looking at angel investors, angel investors typically invest in people that remind them of themselves. It's just a, a, one of the things that happens not, you know, outside of racism and, and closed circles. Um, and they tend to be 50 to 60 year old white men and they rarely see themselves as a 40 something single mother who's black. I wish they did. Does that mean that I cannot raise that money? It does not. It means it's going to be even more difficult. And if we look about, you know, you want these angel investors generally invest in people in their circle, someone with a warm introduction. But if we're talking about minorities, especially black and brown people, we typically have, you know, less than $5,000 in net worth within a, a household. So it becomes very hard to be able to get to those angel investors and get them to open their ears. If we're looking on the other side, VCs, VCs, VCs are giving 2% of their dollars to women-led businesses and 0.0006% to black female-led businesses. We still live in a world where there are less than 100 black female CEOs who've raised over a million dollars in a startup capacity. And that's across all industries. So it is amazingly critical as we start bringing these businesses on that we give them opportunities for funding. You can't say, oh, you can have a business and you need to be able to compete with all these MSOs who are sitting on tens and tens of millions of dollars, but we don't have an opportunity to get cash at all. 
I mean, in, what we're seeing is now we're seeing more opportunities for grants and there are programs. I, you know, I hats off to Oakland. Oakland has loan programs besides grant programs. Los Angeles is slowly coming on, um, you know, and having grant, but even, you know, $50,000, $100,000 is not really putting a dent in what is necessary to open a retail, um, operation. And then you also have to compete against, you know, to Kika's point, people who have had a hell of a long um, lead way on you, on building their business, on building their audience um, and building their coffers who can literally drop prices right next door to you and wait for you to die. So that, that brings up a really good point about sort of the power of competition, of consolidation of these other participants. But uh, as Kika can attest to and the work that she did, there are regulatory hurdles. There's government that's there to set up these systems, try and help. And you pointed out Oakland having loan programs in different places uh, providing these supports. But what are the regulatory hurdles around starting a cannabis business? Maybe something that surprised you. And uh, if you were uh, king or queen for a day and you could wave your wand, what, what sort of regulations would you would you get rid of? Yeah, I think something that people uh, underestimate is entitlements in a city or the permitting process when you're trying to go uh, and get licensed, right? I, um, you you might have this this group down there and they're used to seeing Baskin Robbins and they're used to seeing, you know, a new school that's opening up and they're not going through that code book in a way that they could, right? If they had their, their ears raised up or they were worried about something. But along comes a new industry called cannabis where you're legalizing a drug and you go and turn in those plans at the plan department, right? And they see cannabis on there. Then all of a sudden they're going a little bit deeper in that code book. They're looking a little bit deeper in your plans. And that ends up causing a lot of time, right? Going back and forth. That ends up causing a lot of money. Um, you can easily in a cultivation facility, I've seen people go through uh, work with engineers and the engineers maybe charge them five or six hundred thousand dollars just to do their plans and to go through entitlements with the with the city um, because of some of those regulatory hurdles. Right. That maybe are, are unseen. And then, you know, I've seen a group of engineers who were in a good city and put together plans uh, for thirty thousand dollars. I mean, it could be that different when you think about that aspect of the regulatory process and all the other things you need outside of a license. So I think if I could wave a magic wand, I would definitely um, look at that entitlements process, getting your design engineers, getting your architects, taking it to the city, um, you know, getting your people coming to review the permits. People who are coming on site to review all the safety plans. I would just ask them to treat the cannabis industry the same as they do any other manufacturing facility versus um, putting a lot of extra burden on, on cannabis businesses that, again, sometimes time you out of your ability to open up. You've got to open up in a year and it takes you a year and a half to get through permitting. And all of a sudden you're selling your license. Um, that happens uh, a lot more often. Than I think people understand. Mm -hmm. Kika Whitney. Yeah, um, there's two phases to consider, pre-licensing and post-licensing. So pre-licensing, and, and as Jesse said, and um, Whitney can attest to, you never know how much time it's going to take to open your doors because the policies change going back to why we got to organize because your policies affect your business plan, which affects how much money you have to invest in your business. And the slower you got to organize, once you're ready to hit that go button, the more money you're going to have to spend. And so the first thing we have to do is how to figure out how to get more creative about how we're raising funds amongst ourselves and how to work cooperatively. In the city of L.A., they did not allow cooperative licenses. Um, social equity applicants had to have 51 percent of their licenses. So I couldn't split my 51 percent up with other equity applicants. First of all, but a thing to push for on the policy wise policy side to see how we can work collectively, because if you know someone who has 250,000 and you know someone has 150,000, you can pull your money together. It costs $350,000 for me to hold on to my property for two years before I open my door. Fortunately, my first investor um, dropped me before the lawsuit because he thought we lost and he um, took away that $350,000, gave me back my equity as an opportunity loss. So that was a blessing 
where I didn't have to pay, which uh, most social equity applicants did not have that opportunity. Um, and then it took me about another $150,000 with um, professional fees, licensing fees, security plans, application writing. Um, the requirements for regulations also impacts on how much you're going to pay for your pre-inspection. What security systems? You just can't have regular security systems. Now you're buying the top of the line and you thought it could be $20,000 because your friend cooked you up. Now you realize, no, that's $60,000 because I have to have facial recognition cameras and I need 30 of them, right? Um, and so then, depending on, I'm, I can only speak from a retail perspective, but I opened my store. We do our style similar to a grocery store. Um, and so I started with a million dollars worth of inventory. And I didn't have to pay a lot of that up front, but that is an investment in, and it cost me about 300,000 to build out my store. So you're looking at about $1.6 million to open my doors. Um, when I started, I had a $7,000 runway and had to push business in order to grow my business, but I had raised a million dollars um, and hit that wall with my with my equity or how much I wanted to give out at that point. So the second most important thing was the team building. And I wish I would have done that a lot earlier. I wish I would have known all of the folks that I needed on my team. I had team members that helped me, you know, uh, protest in the community and write licensing, but I didn't know I needed this inventory person, a metric person. Oh, my bud tender should be based on wellness. I need to, if I would have been building my team that whole three years that we were waiting for licensing, and I'm sure folks in New York are going to experience the same. They open up the process, but it's still, no matter where you go, another year and a half, if not more, before you open your doors, you can be using that opportunity to educate yourself and build teams with, with folks Y'all out here that have transferable skills, because we've built our team off of folks that transfer from other industries. We learned the rules and regulations. We studied the policies. And then we were able to operate just like anyone else in this industry. And those two things um, are, are critical. Amazing. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if we should, uh, if, is there anyone in the audience that would like to ask a, a question of our, of our panelists here? Or can, can we open it up there? I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you guys because you can, you can see who's in front of you, but uh, I know we've only got a few more minutes. So is, is there anyone who'd like to ask a question? And I'll let you guys do that directly. Yeah. So, hello. Okay. Yeah. So, I guess you talked a lot about the funds that are required to start a cannabis company. Um, I know 280E, and you mentioned metrics specifically, which is a nightmare to deal with. Um, can you quantify how much damage that's done to your business comparatively? Because I kind of feel like it makes social equity harder because now everybody gets taxed a lot, right? And the only people who can deal with that are people with money. So now it's even harder, right? So, yeah. I mean, yeah, 280 is a nightmare. Um, the, the, that is the law that, um, that uh, basically does not allow us to write off any of our business expenses because we are still federally illegal. Um, which brings our you know, effective tax rate through the roof. Um, and when you're a small business, um, it becomes even more difficult because we don't have access to a lot of very expensive accountants who can jump through hoops and make things happen um, for us. And so uh, the amount that we're paying in taxes is eating away um, on any ability for our businesses to become stable and cash flow positive. Uh, so it becomes even more difficult in that in that regard. Uh, metric is, you know, that's our compliance nightmare. Uh, metric is the program that we use for seed to sell tracking within the industry. Um, so we do a lot of work within that in order to um, stay compliant within the space. So I've, you know, I've got to pay somebody who knows metric like the back of their hand so they can uh, handle that work um, for us. So we've got um, a metric expert in store. Um, and I spend way too much money on um, accountants. I have another business apothecary. It is not plant touching. God bless that business. I had no idea how good I had it <laughs> before I came into this plant touching nightmare because, you know, we're, you know, well over 50% in tax. 
So for anybody thinking about cultivation versus retail, um, this is a plus for cultivation and that 280E is focused on businesses whose expenses are focused on selling a, um, a Schedule 1 narcotic. And very little of the cultivation expenses are focused on selling. A lot of it is manufacturing production. So we are able to write off a significant amount more um, than a retail business or a distribution business. And also metric um, is not quite as big of a deal because, you know, if you could imagine a retail business, there's people moving product every hour, every minute, that has to all be tracked. A cultivation facility is really more so focused on moving plants, you know, once a month or once every two times a month. So we're just saying we're moving this many plants from this space to that space. And then, of course, as we sell, then we'll create invoices and do metric work. But, you know, it's not nearly as extensive as as a retail. I'm glad you asked that question because I missed my magic wand question. My oh. magic wand would be to lower the taxes and exempt social equity applicants from for um, from taxes for the next five years, because it'll take about that long to get our businesses going and to give you some actual numbers. So we understand when we say taxes, 280 is when you get to the federal level. But before you even get to that at the end of the year, you have your city taxes that you have to pay monthly. You have your state taxes that you have to pay quarterly. I'm just a year open. We made our year anniversary in August, our first year. Thank you. Our first year, um, my taxes were $1.4 million that was collected and had to go out of the door, which means my employees don't have health benefits. 98% of my 33 employees are from my community. Half of them are social equity qualified workers. Um, I don't have enough to give them health insurance. I need some more folks working and I can't, I'm at my limit because all of that money is going out. I can't invest in the music program down the street from me or the dance program or the after school program. That's what I should be able to do with those tax lot dollars. I can't even put the money I need back in marketing. You got these big companies that are paying $100,000, $150,000 a month to WeMaps. Right. Where I'm on the social equity plan for 10,000. Imagine the difference in how much folks are driving in versus myself. Um, and so when we look at those city and state taxes at at the retail level, the distributor takes 27 percent off of the invoice. And half of that, about 12 percent is based on the average market price where they say that we market up. 80%. Well, my store is in the hood and I can't mark up my products um, 80% because they'll go right down the street to the trap shop. And I want to make sure that my my community has safe products, so I have to have deals. But the state doesn't care. That distributor collects it. That ends up being 27% with the 15% state excise tax. The city of LA takes 10% and the sales tax is 9.5%. That's 46.5% in taxes that I'm paying before I get to the end of the year with my federal taxes. The consumer is paying 34.5%. So who are they really choosing, especially in inner city communities, when they're going to get their product, which is a very big public health issue. And so if I could wave a wand right now to me, as I mentioned all of those expenses, they're recoupable if I can open my doors and I'm making the sales, but it's all going back right to the government. And then let's ask them, how much percent are they investing in the city of L.A. with one billion dollars collected? How much of that money is going back to my community? Um, it's not. And so once again, that goes to the power of us organizing the people because we there's nobody in City Hall demanding that there be um, open eyes on where this money is going to. And also to make sure that we're able to, as equity applicants, give back to our community instead of giving them these tax dollars that's going to police enforcement. Uh, Brianna and Caroline and, and others that are here, uh, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. I know we're at time. Uh, I don't know if you guys want to extend it out a little bit for uh, for some more questions, but I'll uh, I'll just I'll, I'll step back and if you guys need anything else from me, I'm here. Uh, but I'll let you guys uh, take it from here. Yeah, thank you so much, Brad. We are right at time, so we're going to wrap now. Um, I think our panelists will be around for a bit if anybody wants to come up and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but thank you all so much for coming to this Embracing Diversity Week event. I think it's been really great, and I want to give a round of applause to Kika Keith, Jesse Horden, and Whitney Beattie. 
and to Brad Rowe, our moderator. I wish you were here in person with us. I have a gift yeah, up on the table for you. So when you're back at UCLA, uh, we can text and I can help give it to you. I, I wish I was with you guys too. And if any of you guys are looking, I, I don't know if there's space anymore left for uh, the winter class, but my uh, public affairs 136 cannabis policy in the age of legalization uh, is, uh, is, is up for registration right now. If any of you guys are interested in the policy side of the conversation. All right. Thanks everyone. Thank you.